Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tevedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different applications of the recombinant DNA technology. So far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the uh, generation of the genetically modified organisms. So in that context, we have discussed about uh, utilization, you, we have developed, uh, we have discussed about the transgenic uh, plants and then we also discuss about the transgenic animals. And then we also discuss the utility of these transgenic uh, organisms compared to the uh, normal organisms. And then in the previous lecture, we discuss about the antisense uh, uh, technology and uh, we have discussed about how the antisense technology or the genome editing technologies can be very useful in uh, taking care of the different types of diseases. So, we have also discussed about the gene therapy and gene therapy is a very, very good technique to take care of the correction in terms of the genetic diseases. So, uh, apart from these uh, applications, uh, the recombinant DNA technology is extensively being used in taking care of the different types of applications in the medical science. Okay. So, what are the different types of applications it can have? So, let us if you see uh, the uh, applications of the recombinant technology into the medical science. So, medical science uh, which deals with the different types of medicines and as well as the different types of therapies for the different types of diseases. So, uh, medicines are the class of molecule that used to correct the disturbance in the host physiology. This can be in chemical in nature and used to inhibit the aberrant enzymatic activity from the host or the pathogen. In few cases, the host enzyme can be supplied as a drug formulations to drive the biochemical reactions, biotechnology has potential in contributing into the development of drug molecules. So, as far as the recombinant DNA technology is concerned, it actually can provide the enzyme, it can actually be able to provide the proteins uh, which can be used for the therapeutic applications, it can be used to provide the enzyme which can actually be provide the deficiency and it also can provide the, the, uh, the chance of developing uh, inhibitor because when you are actually having the recombinant technology, the inhibitor can be used to inhibit the enzyme and that way it is actually going to control the enzyme catalyzed uh, uh, re reactions. So, as far as the uh, in today's lecture is concerned or the scope of this uh, topic is concerned, we are going to discuss about the application of recombinant technology in four aspects. One, we are going to discuss about the production of therapeutically important proteins. Number two, we are going to discuss about the gene therapy. Number three, we are going to discuss about the vaccine and number four, we are going to discuss about the monoclonal antibody productions. Gene therapy we have already discussed in the previous lecture, so we are not going to discuss the gene therapy, but all these three points we are going to discuss in today's lecture. So, let us first start with the production of therapeutically important proteins. So, remember that the uh, you have the two options, either you clone that particular gene into the uh, into the uh, into the humans or into the host and that is why the host is uh, automatically going to start producing these proteins. But in some cases it is not possible and in those cases you are actually going to use the uh, you are going to produce the protein in uh, some other host and then you are going to purify the protein and then you are going to supply the purified protein. So, a large number of genetic or the metabolic disease can be corrected by supplying the proteins or to the factor. Following the advancement in the biotechnology, many other proteins or the factors are produced in the different bacterial expression system. In one approach, gene of the enzyme or the proteinaceous factor is cloned into the appropriate plasmid to produce a recombinant clone. So, it is actually going to is follow the same scheme what we have discussed, right, where you are actually going to first take the gene, then you are going to uh, digest it with the restriction enzyme because the gene is going to be amplified with the help of the PCR. So, for example, you are going to take the genome, 
and uh, from the genome you are actually going to do a PCR and that is why you are going to have the gene which has the uh, uh, flanking sequences. And then you are going to digest that with the restriction enzyme so that the gene is actually going to have the cohesive events and then you are going to produce uh, or going to do a ligation reaction with the help of a ligase and that is how you are actually going to produce the recombinant clone and that recombinant clone which is the expression clone is actually going to be transformed into the suitable host. For example, if you are transferring into the bacteria, then the you can culture this bacteria and you can induce this bacteria with the help of the inducer. So, you can actually be able to put the induce inducer and that is how the bacteria is actually going to start producing the protein in large quantity and then this protein can be purified with the help of the chromatography. So, you can actually have the purified uh, protein and this purified protein can be given as the therapeutic uh, agents. For example, uh, there are many examples which we are going to discuss. So, one of the such example is the production of the insulin right. So, you know that the insulin is a dimeric uh, gene or dimeric proteins where you have a A chain where you have a B chain and these two A and B chains are being connected to each other by the disulfide linkages. So, these are the disulfide linkages what is present between the A and chain B and chain. So, what you are going to do is you are going to first produce the, so you are going to take the gene for A and you are also going to take the gene for B and then it is actually going to be cloned into the two different uh, vectors right. So, you are going to have a gene A clone you are going to have a gene B clone right. So, and both of these clones are actually going to be transformed into the bacteria separately. So, you are going to have a bacteria which will have a gene A right and you are also going to have a bacteria where you are going to have the gene B. Then these two are actually going to give you a peptide or the peptide A. It is also going to give you the peptide B. And then these two are actually going to be combined and then they are actually going to give you uh, protein A and protein B which is going to be linked to each other and that is what it is going to be called as insulin. So, insulin is a dimer of A chain and B chain which is linked by the disulfide linkages. So, these are the disulfide linkages composed of the 51 amino acid with a molecular weight of 5808 okay. A schematic representation of the steps in, in the insulin production is given in the figure this figure right. Uh, in this process the gene A and B is cloned into the bacterial plasmid separately to produce the two recombinant clones. Peptide A chain A and B is over expressed into the E. coli and the recombinant together to produce the functional insulin and this functional insulin can be given to the patient for the treatment of the diabetes ok. So, it can be given to the treatment. Now, similar uh, adopting the similar kind of strategies you can also be able to use and produce the different types of therapeutically important proteins. So, so I have given you an example of some of the proteins for example, you can actually be able to use the factor 7a and factor 9a and that you can be able to use for treatment of the hemophilia. So, hemophilia is a disease of the blood clotting where the blood is not getting clot right. So, you are and, and it, it happens because there is a deficiency of factor 8 and factor 9 and these two factors if you supply exogenously then the patient is actually going to be able to clot the protein uh, clot the blood. Then we also have the tissue plasmonogen activators or TPA. So, that also can be expressed and that is also going to give you a cure for the thrombosis. Thrombosis is the development of the uh, uh, clot actually. Then we have the lactoferrin. Remember that we when we were discussing about the transgenic animals and transgenic cow, we said that uh, the, it is actually going to we are actually producing the, um, the milk or which is uh, uh, rich in lactoferrin. So, where you, you can produce the lactoferrin and you can actually be able to use that for the treatment of the GI tract infections. Then we have the human protein C that is also been used for the thrombosis. Then we have alpha I uh, antitrypsin that is being used for uh, uh, physema. 
then we have a fibrogen fibrogen is being used for the wound healing so uh, and then we have the pro 542 then is, this is been used for the hiv infections then we have a anti thrombin 3 that is for the thrombosis and then we have a collagen 1 and that is for the tissue repair and then we have a serum albumin and that is for the correcting the blood volume so this is very very important so the recombinant uh, 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 proteins like recombinant chymosine or is been used in the for large scale uh, uh, protein production the recombinant enzyme is safe to use it costs less and it is available in abundance then we have the recombinant human growth factor or rgf it is produced by the pituitary gland and the hormone is required to support the growth and development of human the recombinant rgf is cheap and safe to use for the haptic applications then we have a recombinant blood clotting factor 8 so in a normal individuals blood loss from a damaged blood vessel is prevented by the formation of a clot blood clotting is a series of reaction involving the different types of factors so factor 8 is deficient in the bleeding disorders such as hemophilia and the recombinant factor A is supplied to improve the disease conditions. So, this is all about the utilization of recombinant technology to produce the therapeutically important proteins. Now, let us move on to the next topic and the next topic is the vaccine right. So, vaccine is uh, given to develop the immunity against a disease in human or other vertebrate animals. Vaccines are of different types, vaccines are the dead uh, organisms, attenuated organisms or the protein derived from them. There are different strategies to enhance the immunological response to give the long lasting protection against the disease with the minimum side effects, right. So, what is vaccine? Vaccine is a product or it is actually a uh, dead organisms right so you know that in a, in a natural way what happen is that when a virus enter into a body right or human body it causes a disease right but this virus is being processed by the immune response and uh, immune system right and uh, the immune system is actually developing a immune response right and this immune response is then killing the virus ok and as a result of this it is actually getting in reducing the severity of the disease and it is actually going to give you a healthy individual ok. So, this is a natural way of doing it right? for example, if you get the influenza virus right influenza virus will enter into the body and it will cause the uh, disease actually or it is going to cause the flu actually. But the same virus if you are going to provide or if you are actually going to provide the dead virus it is actually going to create you know be accepted by the immune system and the immune system is going to respond to the immune response and these immune responses are going to produce the different types of products they are going to produce the interferon gamma they are going to produce the different types of antibodies they are actually going to and then because of these immune response the virus is actually going to be removed from the circulations and that is how it is actually going to take care of the disease. So, exactly the same thing what you can mimic with the help of vaccine. So, that the uh, if in future suppose you have a vaccine right. So, in future if such kind of virus will come then the already you are uh, you are already been ready with your weapons and that is how you are going to take care of this virus infection. So, virus will not be able to cause the disease. This is not true for the virus, it could be for bacteria, it could be for any infectious organism. You can be for virus, it could be for fungus, it could be for any uh, infectious organisms that you can be able to produce a uh, immune response and our body will remember that immune response. So, whenever the same uh, organism will enter into our body in a subsequent time it is actually going to cause the immune response and that is how it is going to give you the protections. So, as far as the vaccine is concerned we have a different types of vaccines. So, we have the killed vaccines, we have the attenuated vaccines, we have a toxoid, we have the subunit vaccines and we also have the conjugated vaccines. So, there are different types of vaccine which is developed for the human vaccinations. So, we have a killed vaccine. So, in this vaccine preparations the pathogenic organism is killed by the chemical or the UV treatment and used as the immunogen. It is mixed with the adjuvant to enhance the immune response and it is a long memory. So, okay. 
So, uh, here what you are doing is you are actually using a killed organisms. Okay. So, you are, you are purifying an organism and then you are using a killed organism and as a result of this it is actually going to challenge the system the same way as the live organism is going to do, but it is not going to cause the disease because it is a killed organism. Right? And then it is actually going to give you a immune response and it is also going to create a memory into the system. So, that whenever the same organism the live organism will enter into your body it will not it will actually going to be experience the same immune response and it is actually going to be not be able to cause a disease. Then in some cases you have the attenuated vaccine. So, attenuated means you are actually uh, these uh, these are the live organisms, but they cannot cause disease, they cannot cause disease. So, you are treating uh, organisms, they cannot cause disease. Okay? So, this is means the attenuated, attenuated means the, per, the organism will be live, but it will not be able to cause the disease and it will does not have the ability to cause the disease. Okay? And uh, these kind of preparations people are using in those cases where you are actually going to have the very high risk uh, titer of uh, organisms and you need actually these kind of organisms to create a long lasting memory. So, in this vaccine preparations organism is treated with the chemicals to destroy its ability to cause a disease. As a result the organisms grow and give a stimulus to the immune response for a long term immunological memory. And then we have a toxoid. So, in these vaccine preparations inactivated toxic compounds are used as an immunogen, which means you are not going to use the killed organisms, you are not going to use the attenuated organisms. In a toxide you are actually going to use the inactivated toxic compound, which is going to be the main immunogen present in that organisms and that is the you are going to use for uh, gen, uh, stimulating the immune response, so that it is actually going to give you the protection against the same uh, organisms. Then in some cases then you have a subunit vaccine, so in this vaccine preparation a pure protein or antigen is given an immunogen. It is the safest form of vaccine with the minimum adverse allergic reactions. Then we have the conjugated vaccine, so in the vaccine preparation the bacterial coat is tagged with the immunogenic protein to induce the production of immune response against the bacterial uh, coat. Apart from this you also have the DNA vaccines, you also have the RNA vaccines. So, a detailed description of these different types of vaccines uh, is available in a, any kind of standard immuno immunology textbooks, although which is not uh, which is beyond the scope of your uh, course, right? But you can, if you are interested, you can be able to take the any of these books and you can be able to study. So, let us discuss about the recombinant vaccine, okay, which is actually been produced from the uh, from the recombinant DNA technology. So, these vaccines are the preparation of the killed, weakened, or the component of a pathogen that can elicit an immune response, but it is not severe enough for the disease to occur. The immune response thus helps to generate the memory B cells and the antibodies that subsequently recognize and fight the infections. The father of vaccine is the Edward Jenner who potentially created the FEX vaccine during the outbreak of a smallpox in the year of 1991. He invented the first vaccine by injecting the cowpox virus into a person's skin to confer the immunity against the smallpox. How do vaccine works? Okay. So, uh, vaccine uh, during vaccination the pathogen live or the inactivated or a component of the pathogen known as antigen is injected into the individual to induce the immunity. Okay. So, what you are doing is you are taking the either the live or the inactivated uh, or co component of a pathogen, right? then you are injecting that into the organisms and because of this it is actually going to activate the B cells and these B cells are actually going to produce the antibodies and these antibodies are actually going to give you the protection and as well as the memory against this particular antigen. Consequently, the subsequent exposure to the same pathogen antibodies and memory cells cell elicit a quick and heightened immune response. 
the most common vaccine given to the infant and young children are dpt which is against the diphtheria pertussis and tetanus mmr which is for measles mumps and rubella and since these are the highest risk due to the low immunity level initially the vaccines were developed mostly by the attenuation or the inactivation of the pathogen so until the people were not aware of the recombinant dna vaccines or recombinant dna technology there was only two choices one which is you are actually going to use the inactivated pathogen which means the dead pathogens or you can actually be able to use the attenuated pathogens but since the recombinant dna technology uh, you know uh, uh, advances so much people have started using the recombinant dna technology to produce the vaccine because when we were using the inactivated pathogens or attenuated pathogens there were cases when the inversion or revision uh, re, uh, reversal happen actually so attenuated vaccine you injected the attenuated pathogen but it actually acquired the pathogenic uh, traits and because of that it actually causes a disease rather than the protections so recombinant uh, vaccines uh, recombinant vaccines are type of vaccine that uses the genetic engineering method to produce the antigen that can elicit an immune response without causing the disease to avoid several pathogenic uh, potential concern raised by the conventional vaccine like the chances of infection in case of live attenuated vaccines reversal of the toxicity to their toxicogenic forms or co purification of undesirable component or to overcome for the complexity involved in obtaining enough purified antigenic component recombinant vaccines were developed using the various tools of recombinant dna technologies recombinant vaccines involving insertion the dna code dna encoding an antigen uh, into an expression system typically a bacteria yeast or mammalian cells the host cells then produce the antigen which can be purified and used as a vaccine there are four different types of recombinant vaccines live genetically modified vaccines recombinant subunit vaccines dna vaccines and the rna vaccines so this is an example of the four different types of vaccines you have the live attenuated vaccines you have the rna vaccines you have the killed vaccines you have the recombinant protein or subunit vaccines you have the toxoid vaccines recombinant toxin vaccine and the mrna vaccines and all of these vaccines are going to be taking care of the different types of diseases for example the live attenuated vaccines your is uh, directed against the yellow fevers measles mumps and rubella uh, it consists of the weakened form of the live virus similarly you have a killed vaccine which is against the polio and consists of the killed version of the live uh, virus then we have a recombinant protein subunit vaccine which is against the hepatitis b vaccines pertussis and the hpv vaccines and the recombinant protein or the peptide from the pathogens then we have a toxoid vaccine which is against the diphtheria tetanus and consists of chemically and heat inactivated form of the exotoxins then we have a recombinant toxin vaccine which example is uh, so it, it is still under development right and then we also have the messenger rna vaccine which is against the sars cov and it uses the messenger rna encoding the antigenic region delivered into the cell by the nanoparticles so let's first discuss first recombinant vaccine that is the live genetically modified vaccine so the live genetically modified vaccines in this vaccine the wild type pathogen is genetically modified to be risk free safe and non pathogenic this is done by deleting or inactivating the pathogenic genes in the genome of the bacteria or virus these modified organisms are developed to weaken or attenuate the disease agents vector based vaccine that carry a foreign gene from the another disease agent also fall under the live genetically modified organisms category so what you are doing is you are actually uh, deleting or you are removing the some of the cassettes or some of the region of the uh, dna from the genome so that it is actually not going to cause the disease these vector based vaccines are bacteria virus or plant carrying a gene from the another disease agent that is expressed and when injected into the host induce an immune response examples of such vaccine include the salmonella vaccines for the sheep and the poultry and a pseudo rabies virus vaccine for the pigs 
for bacteria and virus based vaccine an additional protective agent is also added to the vaccine this allows the vaccine to be viable and safe. Then we have the live genetically modified vaccine an example is uh, vaccinia so an example of this kind of vaccine is the vaccinia virus and envelope virus belonging to the pox family. It has a large linear double standard DNA genome with around 200 genes. The genome of this virus can accommodate stretches of the foreign DNA which can be expressed alongside its genes. So you have the vaccinia virus then you what you are going to do is you are going to take a portion of the genome and then you are actually going to insert or, or mod modify this genome and insert the hepatitis B virus gene and then you are going to insert the herpes simplex virus gene and then you are actually going to insert the influenza virus gene which means you are actually going to produce a vaccine which will be give you the protection against the hepatitis, herpes and the influenza and then uh, vaccinia virus genome with 3 inserted gene is going to be produced right and then you are actually going to use this virus into the uh, multiplication into the E. coli and that is how it is actually going to give you a, uh, a protein which is going to give you the protection against the 3 diseases like the hepatitis, herpes and the influenza. Uh, so once your plasmid is ready then you are going to put that plasmid into the animal cells and that is how it is going to get into the animal cell and then you it is going to start producing the recombinant uh, virus. And these recombinant viruses are going to have the component from the virus side and it is also going to have the component from these 3 genes. And then these 3 genes are actually going to give you or going to challenge the immune system for the hepatitis, herpes and influenza and that is how it is actually going to give you the protection against the these 3 diseases. The rapid rise of the vaccine technology has shown that using the recombinant technology can genetically modify the vaccine virus and make it capable of simultaneously protecting against the several different diseases. These vaccines are known as polyvalent vaccine or the multivalent vaccines. To produce the vaccine vector to be used as a vaccine, the DNA of the vaccinia virus is removed and genes from the herpes virus. Uh, hepatitis virus, herpes simplex virus and the influenza virus are inserted into the plasmid vector. This inserted vector now possesses to gene to essential for the vaccinia virus maintenance and the foreign subunit gene of the interest. These insertion vectors are introduced into the host cell and the normal vaccinia virus. Since the vaccinia virus take over the host machinery, it can replicate into the host cell and it is transcribed to produce the different types of proteins to give you the protection against the uh, hepatitis, herpes and the influenza. Then we have the, so during the viral DNA replications, the plasmids are replaced with the normal vaccinia DNA to produce the recombinant vaccinia viruses. These recombinant vaccinia vector virus vaccines against the hepatitis, influenza, malaria, herpes simplex virus, rabies and vesicular stomatitis have been available since the early 1990s. The most important benefit of using the vector based vaccine is that they stimulate both the production of B cell and the T cells. Consequently, the vaccinia virus offers the elevated level of protection against the pathogens. However, due to the safety concern, none of these vaccines have been licensed for the human use. Then we have the recombinant uh, subunit vaccines. So, Recombinant subunit vaccines aim to elicit an immune response by utilizing a particular segment of the pathogen typically a proteins. Okay. This can be synthetic peptide or an expressed whole protein extracted from the pathogenic organism or the expressed from the cloned gene in the laboratory. Recombinant DNA technology is used to generate these vaccines. This method injects a host cell with the gene encoding the antigen to produce the appropriate proteins. One such example of a subunit vaccine developed against the hepatitis B, a widespread disease that mainly affects the liver leading to the cirrhosis, chronic hepatitis and the cancer. So in these cases the recombinant subunit vaccines what you are doing is you are taking a portion of a protein which is immunogenic. And then you are cloning that into the bacterial expression system and then you are producing the protein. Then you are purifying that protein and then you are putting that protein for the immune reactions. 
hepatitis b virus consists of a core containing the viral dna uh, is surrounded by a phospholipid envelope carrying the surface antigen which is the hbs antigen the key element for the hepatitis b vaccine so in this particular uh, virus you are actually going so culturing the hepatitis b virus and producing these surface antigen is very complicated therefore the advent of recombinant technology the gene coding the hbs uh, surface antigens proteins are identified and inserted into a uh, bacterial uh, plasmids a uh, yeast plasmid expressed in saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae yeast cells what is the advantage of the recombinant subunit vaccines so first is uh, safety only a tiny part of pathogen is used reducing the risk of side effects or the disease then number 2 targeted immune response focuses the immune response system on a specific antigens number 3 the stability often more stable than the live attenuated vaccine with fewer shortage uh, fewer, fewer storage concerns what are the uh, challenges uh, number 4 uh, the challenges are the immunogenicity often require a adjuvant or multiple doses to uh, 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 to achieve the strong uh, immunity so remember that the subunit vaccine is using a small uh, portion of a protein which is actually causing the immune response but the protein is uh, less immunogenic because you are taken a small portion compared to the whole organisms and because of that it requires the either the uh, addition of the adjuvants or the multiple doses to cross the uh, strong immune response then it is also having the production cost because the complex manufacturing processes can be very costly because you are going to clone this protein then you are going to over express then you purify then you test that uh, the, it is not containing any kind of toxicity and all that and uh, apart from that when you are going to produce this protein the, you re actually required the cold chain which means you are supposed to store these into a low temperature so sub some unit vaccines require the strict temperature control during storage and the transport then we talk about the dna vaccines so in recent year the dna vaccine have been one of the promising advancement in the vaccine technology gene of interest are identified and cloned into the plasmid so dna vaccines carrying the plasmid harboring a promoter site cloning site origin of replication a selectable marker sequences and a termination sequences like a polyethyl so you are actually so instead of putting uh, or purifying the protein what you are doing is you are actually cloning that particular gene into a vector okay or a where you are actually going to have the promoter cloning and all those things during vaccinations dna is directly injected into the muscles of the animal cell like the mice generally using a gene gun and that is based on the compressed gas to inject the dna into the muscle now during vaccinations you are going to inject that vaccine into the uh, some of the host cells like for example the muscle cells now what will happen is once it enter into the muscle cell it is going to start producing that particular protein and then it is a start giving you the uh, immune response so dna vaccine can also be administered by the nasal spray the antigen is displayed onto the cell surface triggering the body's immune response to recognize it as a foreign this stimulates both the humoral immune response and the cellular immune response so you don't worry about this humoral immune response and the cellular immune response because it is beyond uh, your capacity uh, the course of your uh, particular uh, chapter right but what is mean by the humoral response that where you are actually going to produce the proteins uh, sorry antibodies and the cellular immune response where you are actually going to activate the t cells and the b cells so that you are going to have the memory dna vaccines are being developed for the infectious diseases like the covid-19 zika and the influenza additionally there are ongoing research on to using the dna vaccines to treat or prevent certain target certain cancers by targeting the tumor specific antigens then we talk about the rna vaccines so similar to dna uh, you are also can be expressed the messenger rna right so instead of putting the Uh, dna you can actually be able to put the messenger rna so that it's actually going to give you the complementary strand and all that so rna vaccine contains the messenger rna one injected for vaccination the messenger rna is directly taken up by the antigen presenting cell 
and the other target cells where the messenger RNA is expressed as a properly folded and glycosylate protein that act as an antigen. These vaccines elicit both humoral and cellular immunity response against the encoded proteins. RNA being labile, the stability of injected messenger RNA is prevented by modifying it in a variety of ways. For example, the addition of 5 prime cap, the length of the structure of a poly A tail, use of the untranslated region and the modification of the nucleotides. Such RNA modifications are also helpful in increasing the immunogenicity of the messenger RNA. Therefore, the RNA vaccines are formulated with the specific delivery system such as the lipid nanoparticles which protect the RNA from the degradation and the increased target cellular uptakes. The thermostability of a vaccine is vital to reduce the need for the cold condition during the vaccine storage and use. Since RNA is un uh, unstable, it needs to be frozen when stored to ensure the longer stability. Efforts are underway to improve the thermostability of the RNA vaccines. Lyophilization or freeze dyeing has been proposed to improve their thermostability. In this direction, the formation of RNA with thermostable lipid nanoparticle as mentioned above have been suggested for improving the thermostability of the RNA vaccines. So, what you are doing in the RNA vaccine, you are actually putting the messenger RNA into uh, lipid nanoparticles and this you are going to deliver. So, what will happen is this is going to fuse with the a particular uh, in a particular cell and that is how this messenger RNA is going to be delivered into the cytoplasm and then this messenger RNA is actually going to start producing the protein and this protein is then going to be elicit the both cellular and the human response. RNA vaccines are comparatively simple and have the high yield productions. Their virus free production process enables the modest and the scalable production facilities. As a result of cell free production, there is a less concern with the respect to contaminating agents. Another important advantage of the messenger RNA vaccine technology is its ability to respond rapidly to emerging viral variants. This means the making modified messenger RNA vaccine for the mutant with changed sequence is quick and simple. Thus, RNA vaccines offer the several advantage over other categories of vaccine including the rapid and the low cost deployment uh, of uh, and the reduced needs for the optimization and regulatory testing, existing optimized and licensed formulation and delivery methods. Furthermore, RNA vaccine require less vaccine doses in each shot and may not require the, uh, more than two doses. Also, it can be produced more quickly and efficiently than the other vaccine in case of the new emerging variant of the pathogens. RNA vaccines are comparatively safe. There is no risk of pathogen reactivations and the RNA is degraded in vivo with no risk of antigen persistent or the integration into the genome. However, messenger RNA vaccine need to be addressed for their improved thermostability. So, once you are going to have the vaccine. What will happen is that at the end of the vaccinations, it is actually going to start producing the uh, antibody, right? And uh, uh, antibody is been going to give you a protection against this particular uh, antigen or uh, this particular uh, pathogen. Now, it is important to understand how the antibody is being produced, right? And if you say the antibody, antibody could be of two different types. It could be a polyclonal antibody or it could be a monoclonal antibody. In your course, we are actually going to discuss about the production of the monoclonal antibody because the polyclonal antibody is not in your course. Now, as far as the protocol is concerned, for the monoclonal antibody productions, what you require is first you are actually going to prepare the antigens, right? Then you are going to emulsify the antigens so that you can be able to uh, emulsify with the adjuvants, right? And then we are actually going to immunize the animals. Once you immunize the animals, it is going to start producing the antibodies, right? And we are not getting into the detail of how it is processing the antigen, how it is producing the antibody, and so on. Then you are going to test the antibody generations with the help of the ELISA, right? So, you are going to uh, 
uh, take out the blood of that organisms and then you are actually going to test whether the antibody is being produced or not with the help of a technology which is called as ELISA right. This also we are not going to discuss right and once you know that it is actually been there then you can be able to uh, collect the serum right and that serum is actually going to give you a polyclonal antibody because it is actually going to become from many clones. So, it is actually going to give you the polyclonal antibody. Now, at this stage when you know that the antibody is produced then you can be able to extract the uh, myeloma cells and you can be able to extract the uh, kidney cells right and that is how you are actually going to uh, fused the myeloma and the B cells. So, at this stage you can be able to extract the B cells and you can be able to take out the myeloma cells right and you can be able to put them for the fusion right and uh, you can be able to isolate the B cells from the spleen you can culture the myeloma cells then you can just put them into the fusion right and once they are fused then you can be able to screen the hybridomas or the fused cells and then you can be able to harvest the antibodies and this antibody is actually going to be monoclonal antibody ok. Uh, we are not discussing about what is the difference between the monoclonal antibody and the polyclonal antibody. So, uh, it is important that you should go through with any standard immunology book so that you understand the differences between the monoclonal antibody and the polyclonal antibody. Uh, in a brief what I what I can tell you is that suppose this is your antigen right and suppose this has the uh, these are the say four places where which can actually be able to potentially be able to give you the antibodies. So, if all the suppose this is number 1, 2, 3, 4 this means it and effectively can give you the four different types of antibodies ok. So, if all the four different types of antibodies are present into the solution then it is going to be called as polyclonal. But if it is a number 1 is only giving you the antibody then it is going to be called as monoclonal which means if a single clone is giving you uh, which is against a particular epitope then, uh, the, then it is going to be called as monoclonal. If all the four epitopes are being involved into the antibody production then it is going to be called as uh, polyclonals. Now, uh, in a monoclonal antibody productions uh, what you are going to do is you are going to challenge the animals as I, as we discussed then you are actually going to uh, collect the B cells right or the spleen cells. Uh, similarly, you are going to collect the myeloma cells, myeloma cells are actually the cancer cells right and uh, they are when then you will put them into the fusion reactions with the help of the PEG and then you can actually be able to select the uh, hybrid cells, the hybrid cells which are where the spleen cells and the myeloma cells are going to be fused together and then you can actually be able to uh, screen these cells for the production of antibodies. So, this we have already discussed right. So, uh, the first is the antigen preparations. So, you are going to have the purified antigens, you can actually be able to get the antigen either from the uh, cloned uh, protein cloned uh, uh, bacterial cells or you can be able to get the antigen directly purified from that particular organisms. Uh, then you can actually be able to purify uh, make it the uh, immunogens right. So, you can actually be mix the antigen with the uh, covid uh, the with the uh, uh, different types of adjuvants and uh, it is uh, going to give you the immunogens. Then you are actually going to do the immunization which means you are going to inject the uh, this particular uh, uh, the antigen into the body uh, animals. So, you are going to do the two times of immunizations. You will do the uh, first time immunizations and the second time immunizations. So, when you do the first time immunizations you are going to inject the antigen along with the complete adjuvants. When you do the second time adjuvants uh, you are going to add the uh, antigen with the incomplete adjuvants. Since I am not going to go through with these details, but uh, these are just given for you to understand and you can be able to go through with this content if you like to. Then after injections keep the body and then you combine the 100 microliter of antigen with the equal amount of fluids incomplete adjuvant. So, this is the second uh, in, in, in injections, the first injection we are putting the complete adjuvants 
and then uh, it is actually going to start producing the antibodies okay and this is this this second injection is being called as the booster right the first injection is called as the uh, injections or the uh, immunizations then you can actually be able to take out a small amount of the blood and you can be able to collect the serum and then you can be able to collect the uh, level of the antibodies with the help of the indirect ELISA. Once that is been shown that the antibody is been produced, then you can actually be able to go ahead with the second step and the second step is you are going to isolate the B cells from the spleen, you can be able to culture the myeloma cells, these myeloma cells are actually the cancer cells right. So, that you can actually be able to culture into the uh, in vitro system, then you are going to put them on a fusion reactions and then you can screen the fused cells and you can harvest the antibodies. So, uh, for this you require a peritoneal execute cells or the PEC cells uh, which are actually going to be used for feeding the, uh, the uh, hybridoma cells. Then you are going to prepare the spleen cells. So, you sacrifice the mice uh, either by the cervical dislocation or the CO2 asphyxiations, soak the uh, dead milk in uh, dead mice into a uh, 90 percent uh, alcohol so that it becomes sterile. Then you are actually going to dissect it with the help of the you know the and then you are actually going to take out the spleen and uh, you are actually going to remove the uh, spleen from the blood right. Then you are actually going to chop the spleen into the small pieces and that is how you are actually going to collect the spleen cells um, and uh, once you collected the spleen cells then you are going to put them into the fusion reactions. So, you can mix the spleen cells and the myeloma cells in a ratio of 5 is to 1 that or 10 is to 1 in a sterile centrifuge tubes. Centrifuge the cells at 120 G D for 5 minutes at room temperature and remove the supernatant. Gently tap the bottom of the tube and add 1 ml of 50 percent PEG or polyethylene glycol. Uh, PEG solution should be added drop wise to avoid the clumping of the cells. Dilute the mixing mixture by adding the 3 ml of warm serum DMEM over a period of 1 to 2 minutes. Centrifuge the fused cells and resuspend the cell in the DMEM containing 20 percent FCS. Then you add the 50 microliter of feeder uh, peritoneal execute cells in 90 cell plate and these cells are actually going to provide the nutrition into the hybridoma cells. And then you can actually be able to uh, go for the next step of screening these hybridomas. Now, what why these uh, we are producing the hybridoma cells because the B cells are actually the HGPRT positive cells whereas, the myeloma cells are HGPRT negative cells right. So, when you fuse them with the PEC uh, you are going to have the three different types of cells you are going to have the B cells which are the primary cells which will not grow beyond a certain number of uh, stages. Then you are also going to have the uh, myeloma cells which are unfused right which will remain unfused and then you are also going to have the hybridoma cells. These hybridoma cells then you are actually going to put them into a hat media. Hat media is actually going to have a combination of the three different types of uh, inhibitors right which does not allow the B cells to grow which does not allow the cancer cells to grow, but it only allows to the hybrid cells to grow because the hat media actually going to cut down the production or cut down the in a, uh, the production of the uh, the some of the uh, nucleic acid synthesis and uh, in the absence of nucleic acid synthesis into the cancer cells it is not be possible for the cancer cells to grow right the unfused one whereas the fused cells are actually going to get the nucleic acid synthesis from the B cells and that is how these hybrid cells are going to grow. And uh, uh, so, myeloma cells will not grow in hat media, unfused B cells undergo normal cell death because they are does not have any kind of ability to grow for a very long time because they have a certain numbers of the division before they will go for death. So, the hybridoma the fused cells are actually going to grow. Now, these fused cells you can culture and then you can be able to screen them for the uh, protein uh, antibody productions. Why the, uh, the, uh, the cells will not grow because of the simple reason that the de novo pathway uh, is essential for the 
is nucleic acid synthesis is essential for the growth and the multiplication of the cells. HAT media inhibits the de novo pathway and the cells with salvage pathway is only going to survive which means the cells which only contains the AGPRT enzyme is only going to survive and AGPRT enzyme is only present in the B cells and it does not present in the myeloma cells which means the myeloma cells will survive if you allow the de novo pathway to grow right. But the de novo pathway you are inhibiting with the help of an enzyme with, uh, with the help of an inhibitor which is called as amnopterin. So, amnopterin is a uh, is a inhibitor which actually going to cut down the de novo pathway and in the absence of de novo pathway the cells only will survive in if they are showing the salvage pathway and you know that the salvage pathway is going to be shown by the cell which actually contains the SGPRT enzymes. Now, so, myeloma cells depend solely on the de novo pathway synthesis where the kidney cells has both de novo and the salvage pathway. In the presence of the HAT which is the hypoxanthine, amnopterin and thymidine uh, individual myeloma cells or the kidney cell will not survive where only the hybrid cell will be able to survive. Now, what you are going to do is you are going to select the hybridoma cells. So, what you are going to do the once the colonies are aware of isolate these cells by the serial dilution method. So, what you are going to do is you are going to do the isolations with you are going to collect these cells individually and then you are actually going to uh, check whether the antibody is being produced from these individual hybridoma cells and then based on these pattern, this kind of analysis you can be able to select the hybridomas from the uh, from the mixture. Now, how you are going to harvest the monoclonal antibodies? Once the color of the media changes, so you, so you are going to grow these hybridoma cells and the hybridoma cells will secrete the antibodies into the culture media. So, the healthy cells that produce antibody is transferred into the 24 well dash containing 30 to 60 ml of complete media of large cell Harvest the supernatant by transferring the culture into a tube at 120 by RT, transfer the supernatant to the fresh tube and adjust the pH 7.2, add 0.1 percent azide and preserve the supernatant at minus 20 degrees Celsius. So, this is all about what we have discussed so far. We have discussed about the utility of or the applications of the recombinant DNA technology into the medical field. So, we have discussed about how you can be able to generate the therapeutically important enzyme. Uh, or the proteins. So, we have taken an example of the insulin how you can be able to clone the insulin A or insulin B gene into the two individual bacterial cells and then you can be able to produce the A, A chain and the B chain individually and that is how you can be able to produce the uh, functionally active insulin by mixing them together. Apart from the insulin you can also be able to use the different types of proteins like the fibrogen, collagens and so on and factor 7, 8 for taking care of the different types of diseases with the help of the recombinant technology. Apart from the this uh, you can also be able to use the recombinant DNA technology to produce the different types of vaccines. So, you can be able to use the recombinant vaccines, you can be able to use for it for the DNA vaccines, messenger RNA vaccines and so on. And in the end we have also discussed about the how you can be able to use this for production of the monoclonal antibodies. So, we have discussed about how you can be able to isolate the B cells, how you can be able to isolate the myeloma cells, how you can be able to fuse them with the help of the polyethylene glycol and once they get fused how you can be able to screen the hybridomas so that you can be able to get the only the hybrid cells not the myeloma cells or the uh, B cells right. And once you got the hybridomas, you can be able to recover the antibodies from them with the help of the harvesting. So, with this I would like to conclude my lecture here. What we have discussed in this particular unit, we have discussed about the potentials of the recombinant DNA technology, we have discussed about the different steps of the recombinant technology and we have also discussed how you can be able to perform the recombinant technology by exploiting the uh, transforming agents or the host cells and how you can be able to perform the restriction digestions, uh, ligations, how you can be able to screen the these ligate product, how you can be able to uh, uh, deliver these uh, construct into the different host and how you can be able to use that for different types of applications. So, with, with this I would like to conclude my lecture here, thank you.